very good afternoon. And yet again, we meet on our conversations on urbanization. This time, we have a very special guest, Anitra Patel from Bangalore. She is an icon in the field of solid waste management. I've seen her introduce herself in very elite gatherings, walking up and saying, I'm, I'm the garbage woman. <laughs> and indeed, there is a reason why she does that. Now, she is a biologist and chemist with an engineering degree and master's from MIT, USA. That's one thing we share, the same graduate school. Another is the passion for solid waste management. And some of you may not know, but most of you would know, that uh, Almitra had uh, um, uh, a PIL uh, against the government of India, and she tells me 41 other entities response. The respondents, uh, uh, you know, the states, the union territories, and others. And this was in 1996, saying why there are no rules for waste management in the country. And it was after that when the Supreme Court ordered an expert committee to be set up, of which she was a member. And when the committee made its recommendations, that formed the basis for the rules that we are now familiar with as municipal solid waste rules of 2000. And if I may say so, we have another icon sitting here amongst us, and that is Ms. Sanchita Jindal, Dr. Sanchita Jindal, who has actually been behind the solid waste management rules of 2016. And these rules are a huge improvement over the rules, rules of 2000. And uh, you know, I'm told that she's completely dedicated herself to every word, every phrase, and for all to see that the framework is laid down. Now, the only minor thing is how to get the bylaws done and then develop enforcement capacity and how to build awareness among people. So anyway, I think I'm getting distracted in the presence of these two very uh, dynamic uh, uh, ladies. Uh, I will actually not say more about Almitra because you all have received uh, her short bio. Um, all I will say is she's currently Swachh Bharat Mission National Expert and her current passions are cleaning up old dump sites and getting phosphorus out of wastewater to save India's rivers and lakes and, and ponds. And I, what she is going to be talking to us about is the latter passion. So with uh, uh, no more time between you and me, I will now request Alistair to introduce the subject. Before we start, I want to ask, how many of you here, raise your hands, remember swimming in your grandparents' village ponds or streams? I mean, then you're speaking to me. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we have quite a few. How many of those have gone back and seen its condition today? Could you do the same today? No. The reason is the detergents which were invented in the 60s and replaced the uh, soaps <coughs> that we used to use while washing in the river bank. <coughs> These synthetic detergents contain a huge amount of uh, phosphorus in the form of STPP, sodium tripolyphosphate. And uh, we all know that NPK is an important nutrient for plants. But more than anything else, phosphorus is important for promoting aquatic vegetation. It's what is called a limiting nutrient. If you can limit the phosphorus, you can limit the growth of the plants. 
So I want to be talking today about, <clears throat> you all can see for yourselves what's the bad effect of uh, the vegetation totally blanketing the water, depriving the fish of oxygen, making the lake, so to speak, dead, unusable, unswimmable, unboatable, and so on. But more than that, I want to talk about a new phenomenon which has started in the last two, three, four years as the situation gets worse and worse, and that is foam. Do you want to put off these lights? This is the... How many of you all remember reading about this in the papers? Daily papers. Yeah. And did that horrify you? Here's another thing the ladies have to endure. Is this a way to revere anything? This is in Bangalore. This is the outfall weir of the Bellandur Lake, flowing past houses in the middle of the town, going under a bridge and a major road. The foam rafts go 10 feet high. They blow in the air across the road, or across the bridge, into the homes opposite. Shopkeepers have to keep their doors, windows closed. It causes any number of accidents. Cyclists get blanketed in the foam, like this. <coughs> it's a, a nice cartoon, but it's not a funny situation. And the reason is that the phosphorus from detergents is not just the main culprit for the water weeds, but that, that was the Yamuna, by the way. And this is Bellandur Lake. Uh, the, when the weeds uh, die and sink down, they consume the oxygen while they rot. That is called eutrophication. So the fish die, odors come out, and methane also forms. And uh, detergents contain surfactants to make the nice sudsy foam which makes us feel that detergents are doing their cleaning job. It's fine in the washing machine, we don't want that foam continuing in our surface waters of India, which they do. And it's not just the surfactants in the detergent which are stabilizing the foam, but when the weeds go down, they also, while decomposing, release surfactants, and these are natural foam stabilizing agents. So that is why we need to limit the plant growth in our urban and rural water bodies by limiting the phosphorus available to them. Oops, what happened? Yeah. Now, here is fire on the foam. This is in Bellandur. The left is in the center of the lake. The right is in that same channel, which I showed earlier, full of foam. And <clears throat> I had forwarded this PPT to a, a, some friends before this talk. <clears throat> and I got some shocking feedback from one of them, Dr. Raja Vijay Kumar, an eminent scientist from Skeli. And he said, it's not the methane burning, it is phosphine, which is hydrogen phosphide, PH3 which is highly flammable and highly toxic. And not only that, he said, if we have more of that, we can expect another Bhopal anytime around Bellandur. It's that bad. Uh, these smoky flames are when the fires uh, set fire to the dry rotting vegetation on the surface before it sinks down. Now, we have been able to demonstrate a solution to this. On the left is again that uh, foaming outfall. On the right, after three days treatment with biocultures and aeration, last August. First, a row of sandbags was laid across the river, uh, partly to introduce the biocultures, also to create a pool uh, 
where we can have some residence time for the microbes to act. And on the right is that same pool after aeration. You can see it's quite clear. And just in three days. The thing is, we can't be doing this every day for every water body in India. So, uh, uh, Washington uh, State, uh, US and Canada did this in 1973 to save Lake Erie. And they did it by limiting the free phosphorus by a giant treaty uh, in 73 to limit it to 2.2%. Uh, some of our detergents, this is long ago, I don't know what the situation is now, uh, contains uh, contain 21% phosphorus. Well, that much, 10 times worse than what the limit is. And I don't know, Dr. Jindal, are you involved with water still? No? All right. Anyone here involved with water? But I had worked on that ABS long time ago. Answer. So, there is one of the symptoms. Yes. I am also Jindal. I'm Dr. Jindal. I'm a scientist at MTUSD. Really? At MTUSD. MTUSD. Oh, I see. Answer. No, no one from the government. Uh, I've been trying for many years, since 2006, in fact, uh, through the courts and otherwise through the ministries. Very difficult to lobby against the MNCs. The pity is that 80% uh, of the detergent in India is controlled by the same three MNCs who are there in uh, US and the EU and know very well how to limit the phosphorus. But they don't do it unless there is a law and we don't have a gun to their head yet. So India has no limits and I would like to open this discussion by demanding them. Thank you. As uh, always, we now open the floor to discussion and feel free to put you can't hear? Can you hear now? Yes. Yeah. Feel free to ask any questions on water pollution, uh, surface water, groundwater, because what we have here is wisdom which is overpowering. So why she has chosen to speak on uh, limiting the use of phosphorus in detergents. If you have other pressing things on your mind, please also put those questions to us today. How much would it cost to limit phosphorus? How much would it cost to limit phosphorus in the detergents? <coughs> you see, this is what the uh, MNCs are saying. Poor people can't afford the more expensive detergents. But the point is, Poor people are affording it today because using their taxes and increasing taxes, the government is spending enormously to get the water needs out. It's an awful waste. It's not covered by any of the six uh, eco rules. But uh, cities, municipalities under civic pressure are forced to spend enormously, like four crores falso, like every three years to get the weeds out, and they come back again. So uh, they will just add it to their, um, their price tag for the detergents. And uh, the poor people have an option to not use expensive detergents. They can go back to Haritha soaps, other things which are less polluting. Uh, or the MNCs can certainly cross-subsidize by designing some lower cost uh, formulations. Now, Mike. Yeah. Uh, Mike, this is very Just important. tell your name. This is Dr. Jindal, Sanjita uh, yeah, Jindal. Yeah, I'm Sanjita Jindal from the Ministry of Environment and Forest. And uh, why this is very important that phosphorus should be limited in the detergents, but at the same time, 
uh, why the lakes means the phosphorus that means the uh, untreated sewage sewage is coming to the lakes and the rivers that is why the foam and this thing is uh, so our emphasis should be untreated sewage should not at all go into the rivers and the government is trying towards that also quite a number of sewage treatment plants have now been installed and I remember in in, in Lake, uh, what do you call, Dull Lake, where we, there were, earlier there was so much sewage, sewage was going inside and we have now stopped, uh, means because we have installed five sewage treatment plants. So uh, nothing is going inside the lake. But so, the yeah. weeds are still... Weeds are, weeds are, na weeds are natural, this thing, whatever okay. runoffs and these come, yeah. then they, but they, these are still quite less than earlier, but this <laughs> recent flood has re uh, really made the... Uh, it brought, it back. brought it back, yeah. Yes. So while they, our emphasis should also be on the uh, no untreated uh, sewage should be drained, or rather untreated sewage should be untreated wastewater should be used for any other purpose. It should not be sent back yes. to the uh, river or lakes. Uh, there are three sources of phosphorus. One is in the detergent itself, which uh, unnecessarily comes into the water. The second is from sewage. Human waste contains uh, phosphorus. Uh, and in fact, a cheeky answer I got from Unilever many years ago at an NGO conference when we talked about limiting the phosphorus as they do abroad. They said, first you stop uh, open defecation in India, which is a cynical remark. And the third thing is agricultural runoff for rural water bodies when the uh, fertilizer is applied in excess or inappropriately, the plant can't take up everything that it is phosphate in quantity. So then there is a lot of unabsorbed N and P and K which runs off into the water bodies. But there's a more important thing that in Germany, uh, where we all go as tourists to admire their crystal blue lakes, Every town above 20,000 population has compulsorily to uh, remove the phosphorus and nitrogen from its uh, effluent wastewaters before they enter water bodies. I wonder if the Spanish embassy can tell us whether that is the case in Spain also. I mean, it's an EU thing, I suppose, now. Indeed, for thank you very much for the opportunity to interact with you. It's very, very brilliant. It's not on, I think. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, and indeed, uh, our regulation is the European Union has common regulation for all the member states. <coughs> uh, this type of uh, messages are, are mandatory for us. Uh, for example, the, the new regulation of the European Union in terms of a phosphorus content in in dish water, etc., etc., is now 0 0.5 uh, grams of the total phosphorus content. This is now mandatory and uh, yeah. mandatory. That is um, with respect to wastewater. Uh, basically, our industry have permissions to avoid. Uh, there are many regions that are already. Um, implementing taxes to to make feasible the payment of the cleaning of the content of phosphorus. There was a intervention uh, from you. Please introduce yourself. There's a plant called water. Can you introduce yourself? Shashi Sharma. I'm Shashi Sharma. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a horticulturist. Uh, there's a plant called water hyacinth. Yes. Yeah. Wheat. You can say wheat. Uh, does it reduce the uh, uh, phosphorus content of the river? Uh, number two, uh, as the lady says that uh, this, uh, you know, water treatment plants, you know, they can reduce phosphorus. How can they reduce? They, they'll reduce the solid waste, not the, uh, you know, soluble uh, phosphorus. Yeah, I was going to come to that. Although Dull Lake may have five sewage treatment plants, <coughs> it only reduces COD, BOD, and controls the pH, exactly. it does not remove nitrogen or phosphorus. None, not a single one of our sewage treatment plants 
reduce nutrients from the water they let into our surface water bodies. Because we don't have, I don't know if we have rules but about we it. Have, we have the CAG is for wastewater standards uh, yeah. for um, inland surface water, public sewer, land for irrigation. And we have standards for fluoride 2.0. Uh, milligrams and uh, 15 for public sewers and that's all for two and marine coastal areas 15 again so no we have standards but not for P and N yeah yeah but only for uh, the treated water yes so the treated water yeah. we are kidding ourselves that it's treated it's full of nutrients and it's fine to give that uh, you know, pathogen-free, odor-free water to farmers, but not to our water bodies, not to our lakes. Yeah. And the... Um, water hyacinth. Yeah, the water hyacinth. Uh, it, like all water plants, uh, it's very good at taking up the nitrogen and the phosphorus, which is what makes them all thrive and grow. It also takes up heavy metals. But that's only good uptake if you take the water hyacinth out of the water. If you leave it for its 90-day life cycle and let it rot and die and sink to the bottom, it goes down with all the N and the P and the heavy metals and the uh, oxygen depletion which uh, eutrophicates our waters. So uh, it's good if you harvest it, it's disastrous if you don't. Dr. Parekh. Okay. I have, uh, you know, at Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research in Mumbai in 92, we set up a vermiculture pit as well as a, a prune treatment through bioculture. Now, does that really remove phosphorus and, and this? Second observation I would have is that if you have to look at the US and Canadian prices of detergent before the treaty and after the treaty, how much change in the prices took place? That's a good suggestion, and I think we need to research that. Uh, I'd like to describe the beautiful system that uh, this uh, IGLDR had in Borivli. Uh, it was a, a square tank with concrete walls and perforated holes on the side. Uh, the kind that gardeners use to pump water for uh, lawns and so on. All around it was a bed of canna flowers. So the sewage, the wastewater from their colony, went by drip irrigation into the canna beds. And the polluted water flowed through the roots of these canna beds. And they took up all the nitrogen and phosphorus. So the water which naturally came through the weep holes into the tank was uh, clean, odor free and fit to use for gardening. And of course the Mali would harvest those dead cannons and let new ones come up and so on. So that uh, removal of the nutrients would happen and it would happen above ground, not in the water. Okay, I have three people waiting, so I'm going to collect the three questions and then get to you. First, please introduce yourself. Yeah. S.S. Yes. Bhakri from Institute of UN and UNESCO Studies. It would be sheer delight if you enlighten us about the current state of Yamuna during its stretch as it meanders through in the breathing ocean, through Delhi and around Delhi, around say 42, 43 kilometer. What is the current status and state of the river? Is it dying? Is it dead? How do you classify it? Yeah, we'll come to that. The second question. So, uh, thanks to mention about Introduce yourself. So, ma'am, you mentioned water hyacinth, uh, that it absorbs the nitrogen, phosphorus, as well as heavy metals, and it should be pulled out of the water. So I wanted to ask you, how do we finally dispose of this water hyacinth so it doesn't end up polluting, um, say, for example, the soil or um, any other elements? 
Uh, and secondly, what is your advice for uh, for young people? How can we bring about reform in in uh, in in water pollution, air pollution, and uh, make air breathable uh, and the water clean? What what should we do? Should we approach the courts? Should we have a movement? <laughs> should we do it privately through entrepreneurship? What should we do? Yeah, Thank you. I'll, I'll come to you. The third one is here, and then we'll come to others. Yeah, we'll take another lot after that. The third one. Okay. Please introduce yourself. Yeah. Jindal. I'm, I, yeah, I'm Anu Jindal. I'm professor of environmental sciences, and uh, we recently did a study with the Ministry of Environment and Forest, and also with the Ministry of Earth Sciences. And recently in India Water Week, we spoke together. And my talk also started in the same manner. How many of you have uh, uh, had water of uh, wells in Delhi 35 years back? I remember when I was a child, I used to you know, drink water from well near my temple, but now it's not possible. So it's not only surface water, it's the groundwater also we have depleted. And that we have proven through our study through Ms. Javad Sciences. 16 major drains of Delhi we have taken. And how it is polluting? Because the, uh, these are all unlined how it is polluting the groundwater. And besides, to your surprise, even the microbes are going down in the groundwater. That is the recommendation of the study. Heavy metals and even many agrochemicals. You talk about agrochemicals in the terms of fertilizers only, but since the cancer cases are increasing, I hope everybody is aware, pesticides are the main culprit, which are also going in the surface water plus the groundwater. And uh, we have given our recommendations. <coughs> we have given with the proper data to our research projects. We have given our recommendation why there are no uh, ban on the pesticide usage in hands of farmers. In other countries, in Europe, America, there is specialized pest control regulators in agriculture farms who bring the pesticides and spray the pesticide according to the threshold level of the pest. Yeah, we got the question. Huh? Thank you. There's one other question waiting on that side. Dr. Kapoor? <coughs> you, please don't, please don't. Yeah. I have some cogent questions and some witty comments because the speaker happens to be related to me in some very odd and complicated and convoluted manner. <laughs> uh, he was it, my chemistry instructor. No, so <laughs> That can hardly be called convoluted. <laughs> no, stop downgrading me in this fashion, and I'm so incomplete of the August people. Uh, but never mind, that's a bit private. Uh, I want to know the phosphate, in which form it is. Is it dissolved? Is it colloidal? Is it in a slurry? Or how it is? Two, would you ask the lady from Spain what method they use to get rid of it? Since any method that is used to remove any poisonous substance is equivalent to concentrating a substance. Some years ago, we developed a beautiful method of removing arsenic with which people in Bengal, the hard side are dying. I'm still dying, I suppose. Yes. The problem arose, how do you, what do you do? There is arsenic few parts per million, and now it becomes few parts per hundred. What do you do with it? The point I'm trying to make is, technology can be developed, it is easy. If you have bright people like me, it is even easier. <laughs> uh, but, Implementation of that, especially in our country, with our kind of people, I mean, uh, the present company is not included, uh, is very difficult. How do you implement a technology for removing phosphate where the vested interests are against you? Phosphate, <coughs> greed. 
and sloth. And I am all right, selfish death. I am all right, let him go to hell. How do you do? And I speak this because I know you hold me in contempt now. I suppose. Uh, I spent 11 years chasing that technology from Suriname to the border of Alaska and uh, Thailand, where witches become beautiful women and seduce tourists, to the Bundelkhand Dekoiti area. And what did I get? What did I learn? The biggest lesson I learned was, it is not, it's not technology. It is the people's selfishness, interest, sloth, etc., etc., etc. But I don't like. Yeah. Thank that. you. No, no, no. But I, I are you getting free? Yeah. So <laughs> In mineral processing, a great deal of effort over hundreds of years has gone in what is known as flotation which is separating bad mineral, unwanted stuff from it. Now, flotation is essentially based on surfactant, bones, rocks, and so on. There's a great deal of knowledge available with, you can, what is called ionic flotation, dissolved phosphate can be floated out. What is called uh, tank flotation where some, I mean, there are all kinds of things. I suggest that you please look into it, or you ask someone if the Institute of Science has still with some very bright people in this area, and see if that will work. But again, the problem is you, you can demonstrate the technology very easily with some effort. But to get it going in this country, God help, it's very difficult. Thank you. I have the gentleman here wanting to ask a question. Krishan. My name is Prabodh Chawla. I, uh, I found a trustee of a networking group for Good Governance. Uh, the question, two, three questions which come to me. Uh, number one, is this form phenomenon elsewhere in India also besides the two which we are talking about, which is the Yamuna and the Bidundar Lake. In, as far as I know, the Yamuna water, even after treatment, is highly poisonous. And is, it, is the Bidundar Lake water also used for drinking purposes at all? Or is it not? It's years since anyone could Okay. So we, we are in a, as you said, we are like Bhopal tragedy about to happen. Now, since you started your intervention in Bilinda and you live in Bangalore, what effect has actually happened? Because as I see it from what one reads and what one sees, on the TV, it's only getting worse. So, uh, are we on a ticking time bomb which is going to explode? Or what, what are we actually doing about it? What is the state government doing about it? What are the companies, the IT companies, which are philanthropic doing about it in Bangalore? That's it. Thank you. Would you like to take this set? I think that's, yeah. I already gave up on the first one. <laughs> that is the point. I did. Uh, now, this, yeah, well, yeah. Anu had six major trains for the anyway, yeah. uh, study. Coming back to some that I remember, uh, the, there are, of course, uh, easy and simple ways to remove phosphorus from wastewater. Uh, I think. Uh, alum is one of them. But alum is not suitable to apply on land. It will clump up the soil particles and it's not suitable. But the point is that phosphorus is not just limiting for plant growth, 
it itself is a limited resource. There are scary stories, the world's going to run out of phosphorus in 20 something or the other, and so on. And India has very low uh, phosphorus, rock phosphate deposits. Uh, it uh, is importing almost all of its uh, phosphorus for the NPK for the agriculture industry, mainly from Morocco and I think China. And what I would like is to get the phosphorus out of water and onto the land in a beneficial way so that we can get it out as uh, in a form of fertilizer. So in fact last month I spent 10 days at a factory with a uh, Texan expert who came down to try his uh, try uh, large scale proof of concept of his bench scale success using algae and fly ash to uh, precipitate out the phosphorus. And then obviously both fly ash and algae are beneficial for the soil. So if something like that could work, this is very much a work in progress. Uh, this is the kind of solutions I'm looking for. Also the state of Yamuna is another yeah. question. Which was, uh, the, as you pointed out earlier, why put the phosphor in the water in the first place? Yeah. Yes. And coming to the question of what can young people do, what I have been asking for for a long time, and I would like every one of you here who can do anything about it or would like to try, to demand that Section 51A of our Constitutions, it's the only section which has a duty for citizens as opposed to duties for the government and the state, is that we must protect our uh, rivers, waters, wildlife, and so on. How are we going to do it in the absence of knowledge? So, uh, just as, uh, uh, you know, aspirin and things like that have a label saying what is the content of each one, uh, even of other medicines or food products in order, declining order of presence of ingredients, I think we need mandatory uh, eco-labeling, declaration of the phosphorus content on the packaging. Then every individual who cares can look at the price, look at the phosphorus content, decide for themselves whether they want to be an eco-friendly purchaser or not. And then there is no, this is step one before we get the MNCs to uh, permit India to limit the phosphorus. So this is very easy and I have been unable to find the right ministry who would take the decisions. I was sent from fertilizers and chemicals to consumer affairs to the BIS and the BIS said we can certainly put that in the standards but it's meaningless. All our BIS standards are recommendatory until and unless some law says you shall produce detergent only as per BIS something or the other. Just having a BIS standard alone is without enforcement is meaningless. And coming back to the toxicity of the Yamana or Belandur or anything, it's not just a question of the sewage which is uh, coming in. All our stormwater drains, which were supposed to carry rainwater runoff safely to prevent flooding, are now open sewers into which industrial waste is also chucked. Uh, oils, chemicals, and uh, electroplating industry wastewater will throw in chromium, nickel, everything else. And no one's looking. A lot of this just happens opening a tap at night. And India is so weak in regulating, enforcing anything. Any regulator can be bought, I'm sorry to say. And they'll wink and turn away saying, oh, this is just one case. But if there's a million such cases and a million winks, we're going to have poisonous lakes and rivers. Which questions? Dr. Kapoor's questions. 
implementing um, technology. It's very uh, difficult. Yes. I wanted to know about digital transformation, Germany and Spain. Yes, I, that's what I've been trying to find out. I haven't got the answer yet. I think it is alum, but that alum will end up in a concentrating the phosphorus, <coughs> which is not toxic as such. It's a useful uh, element. It will simply end up wasting it in a landfill. <clears throat> along with the alum sludge. So this is why I'm keen on a technology which can concentrate the phosphorus, take it out of the water and onto the land where it is required for land plants. Yes, Mike. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we we'll come to you after. Yeah. While talking about the eco-labeling or something, you must be knowing that India has the eco-labeling scheme. Eco-mark. Eco -mark. And voluntary, and not a single yeah, taker. Yeah, not a single taker is there. Because it's voluntary. No, it's a voluntary, but voluntary also there is no takers. So, the, and yes. ultimately the scheme has to be checked out because there are no, no consciousness in the country and people are not uh, ready to pay more for uh, eco-friendly products. No, the people were never given a choice. No industry subscribed to it. They all said people won't buy. They never trusted the public to be green. It never even began. Yes. You want to, to speak? Yeah. Thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, I was wondering if indeed uh, putting together uh, in a platform all the stakeholders involved in the management of phosphorus industries, etc., might help. In the knowledge does exist. The challenge is implementing regulations, existing regulations, and how to put into practice all, all the very important knowledge, the knowledge uh, that is existing already. Uh, that is uh, starting to implement is the real challenge because the knowledge is there. And uh, perhaps uh, legislations can be compared uh, identify some, some aspects that might be shared, but uh, the challenge is implementing, as, uh, as it has been told, the target of phosphorus removal and nutrient recovery is a win-win solution. It's earning money, it's saving public expenditure. And this is a key element in many legislation uh, elements uh, and instruments even in India, and the challenge is just to implement. Yeah. Mr. There was Christian Kaldra. Shall we just yes, uh, please. respond to that in yeah. the meantime? Uh, this 2.2% uh, uh, limit, which uh, was introduced to save Lake Erie from eutrophication, it was a bitterly fought legal battle. Uh, beautiful uh, case history on the net, which I can forward to anyone interested. Uh, but it was one ultimately uh, through a wide um, public information campaign, explaining to people the, the costs, the risks, uh, and uh, the reason for this. So public pressure ultimately made the MNCs give in. But the point is, we have the whole of North America with 2.2%. We have the EU, and now she tells me 0.5, which is music to my ears. So why can't India at least start with 2.2? We've got all the precedents. We don't need to get together with the stakeholders and reinvent the science. It's all been there. It's all documented. There's about 3 million entries on phosphorus and Lake Erie, if you Google. What is the realistic cost of limiting the phosphorus to 2.2 percent? Let's say take at the beginning point. Number one. Number two. If these companies are aware that phosphorus up to 22 percent is like is very harmful for the when it goes to our water bodies, what justification are they able to give to the government? Even if there is no law there, I'm sure that the civil society has pointed it out. You pointed it out. They're aware about it, but why would they not produce it uh, with uh, a lower limited content of phosphorus? I have not got a single uh, detergent company 
to answer my queries on cost. And if you see that the cost of a detergent, maybe the raw material cost is a fraction, the humongous packaging, advertising, uh, commissions, uh, retailing chain cost, that must be easily 70% of the cost of a package. So even if you increase the phosphorus alternative uh, cost, zeolites and so on, uh, fractionally, it's, it's going to be very minimal on the uh, total end price of the package. And uh, the answer that I've got in any, like in this NGO meetings and so on, you are anti-poor. You're not thinking about the poor. Who poor things, they can't afford it. Now, I leave it to you whether that argument holds in this 21st century. Yes, please. Yes, please. Problems, cocktail of pesticides have been found in water bodies. Nit nitrogen is more, heavy metals are more. So uh, even I am unable to find a ministry <laughs> to enforce that these pesticides should be in the hands of regulators. I went to ICR, I went to ICMR, I, okay, Ministry of Chemical and Fertilizers. But I think there is no body who is ready to listen to me, when other countries can have regulatory bodies for the use of these poisonous chemicals, why can't India have this? Yeah. If you leave when the point is that, well taken, yes, yes. we have a few others, so let's... Uh, I'd like to just respond to that. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a great need for some kind of regulation because those uh, mass deaths in Yavatmal were because uh, people decided this is a buffer crop and they will use a cocktail of six pesticides. And I was told they even put pesticide in their liquor the night before so they can function in this horrible environment spraying the pesticide. So, but I would like to pick up on that uh, thought about the flotation and the ionic thing. I think we need to analyze the Yamuna and Belandur forms. Who's here who can do chemistry stuff? And see whether there is more phosphorus in the form than in the water. Yes. You have heard of Florida slimes, phosphate slimes in Florida? Hundreds of spare Okay. Uh, hundreds of square creeks. You're disturbing my stream of thought. Uh, hundreds of square miles of space is under perfect line in Florida. When I was a student, it was a major problem what to do with it. It would not settle down. It would evaporate and it seeped and was destroying the surrounding land also. I think it's worthwhile, I'm not in it anymore, but it'll be worthwhile for you to find out if any solution has been found uh, for the, because that is quite close to the problem we are having, except that that was deliberately created, the slime from the flotation of appetite was simply pushed into water, water bodies. And then they sit there, nothing grows, nothing can survive in there. But they don't care, America has so much land, and also so few people, they can move them, whatever they can do. It might be worth your while. Yeah, I'll look into that. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Yes, uh, good evening, Madam Madhu Arya, and uh, Madam Patel, my name is Raj Nandini. Uh, Madam Patel, my question is, uh, well, a little away from phosphorus. It is that, uh, and you have been at the helm of affairs of ecology and, uh, yes, I mean, protecting ecology of this country. Nibbling, yes. nibbling at the margins, <laughs> no help. <laughs> no, um, uh, Madam Patel, my question is that, uh, unlike the Ganges, uh, which uh, has floods every year, and a lot of the cleansing of the Ganges happens naturally, and a natural, uh, process of the floods it receives. Uh, the Yamuna especially that flows through Delhi uh, doesn't have that uh, 
you know, that natural flooding every year and therefore a lot of the toxicity is retained in its waters. Ma'am, uh, in our country till now, the use of plastic is uh, widespread in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and there has not been any, uh, you know, stringent laws to curb the menace of the use of plastic. Uh, whether it is in the form of carry bags or in any form in our everyday lives, how do you think that, you know, this can be like uh, made a law and the use of plastics in order to pollute the Yamuna, it uh, can be curbed and, uh, and make the citizens abide by, its, uh, by the rule. Thank you. We keep coming to political and administrative will and enforcement. And as far as carry bags are concerned, uh, banning is not the solution. Bangalore tried it. They banned the thin polythene carry bags. And what came in its place, which people don't realize, is non-woven cloth feeling like non-woven. And it's also plastic. It's just that people haven't begun chucking it yet. But otherwise, they are thicker and worse. So what we need is a ban on chucking, not a ban on using. Just sensible chucking. And what I've been doing for 50 years, I just put all the small and odd plastic bags into one big bag, and then at the end of the month, I just go and give it as kachra dhanam to some waste picker or kabari wala. It's as simple as that just hangs on the kitchen shelf. Uh, you had a question. Yes. 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 So they, it, it, it actually... The, the rules are there. The rules are there. Who is following? I'm, I'm, I'm told now uh, the municipal bodies have started uh, fining even the vendors, vegetable vendors who are giving those thin pannies. So now it's being implemented, I'm happy to do. Uh, but the point is, yeah. what are they giving instead of money? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If they are giving the non-wovens yeah. and charging for it, that's also plastic. Yeah. It'll also so that. that is what even from our side also, if you see one of the epidemics we have given from the ministry, that plastic is a very important and very uh, usable material. Useful. Useful material. However, the handling and management is poor. So people should know uh, how to throw it, how to not to litter and all those things. So I have asked all the people who uh, seek plastic bags, have you tried a month, a week, a day not using plastic? Yeah. And the plastic comes to you whether you like it or not, in your snack food, in your rice and peanuts and dal and everything, as part of the packaging of it. Even your six apples, six tomatoes get wrapped in plastic now. Who needs all that? Yes, please. Namaste, ma'am. I am Amit Srivastava from JNU. Uh, my question is again to uh, environmental law side. Uh, because you asked that we should demand, but where to demand? More PIL are about political issues, about caste, preservation, and so on. And even if someone goes for an environmental related PIL, it will be not entertained. And our legislators, right from center to state, are not interested in environmental laws. So uh, where to demand? To uh, simplify my question. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the Supreme Court for entertaining my PIL and we got uh, the solid waste rules and now a hugely improved version of them, all thanks to the courts. But really when so many people like you ask, I say courts are not the root. Do what you can uh, with uh, influencing decision making in small ways uh, in your own circle and wider and wider. In your apartment, in your mullah, in your town, in your district, in your state. And uh, the problem is, I myself would like to be a green buyer. I would like to buy uh, 
a low phosphorus detergent, but I don't know which one is low phosphorus because there's no label on it which says what the phosphorus content is. That's all I'm asking. Enable me to follow my constitutional duty of Section 51A to protect my water bodies. We have a question from that side. Please. Why do you say that? Would you introduce yourself? Raka Snapal from an NGO called Angaja Foundation. Why do you say that? I mean, what are the reasons that you have for saying that plastic should not be banned? Poly bags and other kinds of plastic. The lady there was saying plastic is very good. Because, you know, plastic doesn't dissolve for many, many years, for thousands apparently. So, you know, why, why, do you, why do you say? I mean, you know, should there not be an alternative to plastic? We should be carrying on with poly bags and, you know, plastic, as you said. It's, it's in your hands. How many times have you refused a poly bag? I do. I, I do it all the time. Yeah. Maybe you do it all the time. Maybe she does. The more of us that do it, the less the plastic will be there. But a ban is not working because it is hugely beneficial as a packaging material. Is there no alternative? I mean, don't you think there's an alternative to plastic? Yes, what alternative? Alternative? Paper, which is recyclable. Uh, it gets soggy and loses its strength for carrying, if you're carrying wet vegetables. But if you have a ban on poly, then people will bring their own bags. You know, they probably bring their own cloth bags. No, what, what has worked in Ireland uh, is that they have a five cent price on uh, plastic bags, and there was a 95% reduction in supermarkets in the demand for bags. It was just 5%. That's a rich economy. They could afford it. But it bothered them. Why should I pay 5 cents when I can bring my own bag? So I know so many people who are bringing their own bags. And I think this economic incentives or disincentives is the way to go not a ban which no one can enforce. We can't control rape and murder. Where are we going to chase people selling plastic bags? I think yes. I had a small comment on that. Basically. Yes. Like in these new rules, we have introduced the pricing for the bags. Like Nobody is doing it. Nobody is doing it. It's getting implemented. And secondly, coming to that, the very property of plastic that it, it doesn't biodegrade for many, many it's years. It's plus. It is, it is the plus point for. Yes. And there has been a study done by Fiki and Blue 3, uh, ENY and all those. They have found that plastic packaging versus the other packaging. The plastic packaging is so much less, five times lesser carbon uh, footprint. uh, footprints it has lesser. So plastic has many, many advantages, but only thing is we have to manage them very properly. That's the only thing. Yes, please. Good evening. Uh, thanks for a nice presentation. My name is Manish Agarwal. Uh, I work with the Quality Council of India, QCI. Uh, as you said that uh, BIS is making these standards to the national standards making body, Bureau of Indian Standards. But uh, now recently, last year, uh, the BIS Act has been amended and the technical regulations and the standards what BIS is making, now government has full power, it has given full power to the government that if it uh, founds it necessary, it can uh, strictly Im uh, implement the standards and the uh, technical regulations for any, uh, uh, because BIS is making standards for all walks of life. Uh, it is adopting uh, ISO uh, international standards as well as making IES in Indian standards and it also uh, making technical regulations in all uh, fields. So it is, I mean, the new law has given teeth to the government to, I mean, uh, uh, empower the government to implement the BIS standards uh, if it founds it uh, necessary in the uh, public interest. Thanks. The government does not need these teeth. It's always had them. The government has to put pen to paper and say you shall, not you may. That's all. BIS just is an available standard. But now oh, we are, we are this we have to the use these BIS standards, standards as the mandatory in our rules, like in plastic waste management rules. The also only also. when the government puts pen to paper and says you shall follow BIS, yeah, so we does have, that become mandatory? Yeah, we have in plastic, we have plastic So if rules. BIS makes a phosphorus standard, 
unless the government puts pen to paper somewhere and yeah. says detergents shall follow, <coughs> the BIS thing is meaningless. Yeah. So same thing like in plastic rules, we have introduced, we have taken it's from specified. the BIS, we have specified that all plastics having dyes and uh, this thing, they will follow these, these, these BIS yes. standards. Yes. Yes, please. आजकल हमारे छोटे गांव विलेजेस में भी पोल्यूशन आ रहा है बिकॉज ऑल दी फास्ट मूविंग कंज्यूमर गुड्स पीपल आर लुकिंग टू दैट मार्केट द अर्बन मार्केट इज सैचुरेट बट आई थिंक यू हैव टू स्टार्ट विथ कंट्रोलिंग वेर द मैक्सिमम पोल्यूशन इज विच इज द मेट्रो सिटीज एंड दैट विल ट्रिकल डाउन टू दी अदर्स Once you get someone making low mercury tube lights for all the big city street lights, those sale will be available in villages. You can't make a rule for that. And I believe that we must begin with the government uh, setting the example. For the mercury tube lights, for instance, I was always urging, let it be uh, mandatory that all public sector industries, all government bodies, municipalities, railways, defense, they should only order and specify and buy low mercury fluorescents. Let them, if the government itself just puts in its tenders that let us uh, buy low phosphorus detergents for, for all our things, mm -hmm. the companies will be forced to produce a line of low phosphorus to declare the low phosphorus so they can even get the tenders and then it can trickle out to others. I see a hand there at the back. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Pratap Chandwani from Green Shakti Foundation. Uh, two things. One is uh, lady there had, uh, uh, had mentioned about uh, Yamuna not uh, self-cleaning itself. Well, I think it does. We see on ground, it does every year, I and mean, then from September onward, it gets dirty again. So, we, Yamna does clean up, uh, and the stink also. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, you can have this offline. Yeah, yeah. One, one second is uh, on this uh, business of plastics. Uh, has somebody tried uh, building an economy around it where you collect all this plastic waste and put it through a pyrolysis so you can produce industrial oil? and therefore pay for this waste that you collect. So there's an incentive. So has, has that been tried? Uh, yeah. Maybe uh, have I would like to say <coughs> that the 2000 solid waste rules have an excellent cl clause where producers of non-recyclable packaging have to financially support municipalities to manage the waste which they produce or take it back. And this is especially for fast food packaging, kurkure, namkeen, that kind of thing. But no city is asking for it. I keep going from city to city saying, demand your EPR, ask for the money, ask for a shredder, ask for an auto to take it to a half mix plant for doubling the life of your roads. But I just see a total lack of political and administrative will which is keeping this country dirty. Would you like to add something? No, oh, I was about to come to that EPR only, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. okay, one question from this end. And that will be the last. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, good evening. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Summer. I'm an independent uh, market researcher. Uh, if I may ask a question on uh, solid waste management, is it covered in this? 
The rules are you can ask any question. Okay, fine. <laughs> I, I have an interest in uh, organic uh, waste management, essentially food waste. So uh, there are these bins that you see all around Delhi. When I when I started, it was uh, the blue was for non-biodegradable waste, the green for biodegradable waste. I went somewhere in central Delhi, and I saw the label. The 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 blue is for dry waste, and the green is for wet waste. There seems to be a change in nomenclature, and uh, while I was studying this subject, there is an immense first mile problem in Delhi, which is of segregation of household waste at source. So a lot of these rat, uh, rat pickers and agencies have to do it, take food from households, uh, take the stuff from households, the waste, and do it. Do you have any experience about Bangalore? Has it been done? Uh, uh, have been, has the municipality there uh, enacted any law on this? Thank you. We have the excellent solid waste rules. We don't need to go further. Bangalore claims to be, uh, it is doing door to door collection. They claim to be having 50% success with segregation. But close to my place, which I have visited often, I can see that the segregated wet waste is mixed with the mixed waste and chucked in a quarry pit, which is the worst possible place to put it. The Supreme Court has fined them 25 lakhs, but that's peanuts for them. They're just continuing with their bad practices. But for the small uh, topic here, uh, solid waste management rules also gave the color bit. Or actually, although we did a different one, uh, it's white, it's white and black. Yeah, white and black and green. Yeah. So these are quite different things are going on. But the people, are, even our own ministry, is not following other ministry. <coughs> is not following whatever is given in the rules. Not only yeah. not following the color, the color, not even following the chucking in the correct bin. Yeah, they are, they are also Whether giving it's blue or bins. green, white or black. Yeah, two bins. They are yeah. also giving two bins. While the solid waste management will say three bins. Yeah. yeah. A, a suggestion only in a half chest. Persuade Baba Ram, they have to make a low glitter. <laughs> <laughs> Questions and then go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Is it a good idea? Yes. Yeah. Yes. People listen to Baba's more than the government. Good evening, ma'am. This is Gagan Negam uh, from INFS. Uh, we were doing a study recently on the sewerage management systems. Uh, so we uh, did this research in Udaipur. City of Udaipo, they we found that you know even though the sewerage system was laid around 20% of Udaipo is covered with sewerage systems, the way it is covered is not proper. As in there are three things that need to be connected to the sewerage system. One is the bathroom waste, the kitchen waste, and uh, uh, pan toilet. Uh, yeah. So basically, you know, all the three are not properly connected to the main sewerage line. So basically, only either the kitchen waste is connected or uh, the bathroom waste is connected. So what happens is the rest of the waste actually comes on the road. Uh, through the Nala, it enters the river and it pollutes it. So one of the pollutants can be the detergents. So city of Udaipur actually did a pilot through uh, something called Green Bridge Technology, which is very similar to uh, what you actually did in Bangalore. Okay, we'll take the next question and Almita, then you can answer. This is the last. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Sohit Chatravedi. I'm developing a series of biotechnology businesses. I have a lot of questions uh, we go on for many hours, uh, unfortunately. So, shall I ask you them after this lecture? Yes, yes, offline. I'm okay. available till midnight. Okay. Like. Well, in that case, as I expected, not only have we had a full house, but we've had extensive interaction. I don't know how to thank you, Almitra. We have today <coughs> the India Habitat Center missing from the podium, our partners in, in this series, because there was another uh, event that was going on, and Mr. Tucker had to go there. But uh, on behalf of India Habitat Center and ICREA, let me once again thank you and keep patronizing us because this is really your forum. And I always tell our speakers that any question can be asked. 
And if you can answer, do that. If you can't, let there be even a conversation. And it really has been going very well. So thank you very much, and we'll meet again two months later.